Good morning, Southland. We're so glad that you're with us today. And all of you online, we're glad that you're with us as well. We're going to have something that's going to happen today that has never happened. And I've been doing this for 25 years, and this is new for me. And that is that we have a documentary that is going to, have to be taking some pictures of one of our members here during worship, who is also a missionary that we support. So I'm just going to go with it. I invite you to do the same thing, uh, even though the cameraman is going to be right over there. So Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, and just uh, why don't we just stand together, and let's worship together and praise God together. Again, thank you for being here today. Sing together. Father's work. And when we 
see it, we realize what a wonderful and powerful and incomprehensible un un God we have. This song, I hope you'll sing along. At the end, it gets a little complicated, but join in. This is my father's world, a favorite hymn of mine. Sing along with us. Sing together. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me. Music 
Father, thank you that we know you, the one who created it all, live in us. And it is your world, and we are your people. In Christ's name, amen. There's a song that's a song you're going to love. It's called One Day, and it is, talks about when we go to heaven, talks about our hope. It's an amazing text. I want you to sing it. It's easy to learn, and just sing it. When we all get to heaven is in it, we're going to sing that too. Join us. Yes. 
think of these promises that we've sung about this morning and we've focused on who God is, I'm reminded sometimes through the scriptures that our greatest act of worship is how we translate all this joy and all this gratitude into the way we treat others, especially the least of these. And I think of Jesus' words when he said, I was in prison and you came and visited me. And Marty Schmaltz is here just to tell you a little bit about what we're doing um, in, in encouraging her and her husband, Larry, and their prison ministry. This weekend, one is coming up, and I wanted her to tell you about it. It blew my line. I was going to say, I'm going to prison this week and try to get a reaction. <laughs> but Sorry anyway, <laughs> um, we go into the prison with a ministry called Kairos, which means God's special time. And what a special time it is. Uh, we, get, we go in, there probably, we can serve 42 women on our weekend if we have enough team. This time, we're only going to be serving 36. But God's got that. There are different Kairoses. There is Kairos Men and Women. There's Kairos Torch, which serves youth incarcerated. And then there's outside prison ministry where we serve um, the women in the lives of those that are incarcerated, which is all very powerful. So let me tell you a little bit about it. On the first day we go in and we kind of introduce ourselves and try to get comfortable, like I'm trying to get now, <laughs> and um, like a lot of the ladies that go in, and men I'm sure too, are a little uncomfortable as far as in that prison environment. So we greet and we introduce and we talk about what they, what their chores are as far as in the prison and hope that they like us enough that they'll come back the next day. So on the second day, on Friday, we are all seated at different tables. They're called family tables. And you will have six offenders and three um, team members at each table. And um, during this time, we're hoping that they can get to know each other. Uh, it, things are very secretive in the prison. They don't like to talk about um, what they've done sometimes because they can't trust anyone. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work on a little bit of trust. Um, team members, as we've walked in, they've probably seen us as these churchy, churchy, holy, holy individuals, which, as you know, we're anything but that. And um, so on Friday we start, and we start to give talks. The team starts sharing. And um, Friday we're doing like encounters with Christ, choices, you're not alone, and it goes on. And as team members start to share their testimonies and become vulnerable to these ladies, the ladies start warming up and becoming a little vulnerable themselves. After each talk, they do a poster and, uh, of what that talk meant to them and how it spoke to them. 
And so um, then, during that time, there is a point where we share what community is doing for them. And our communities, churches, the whole church can really take part in a Kairos if you're not interested in going in. We have posters that we have teenagers make. We have um, placemats that little kids can make. Um, and we have prayer that we can all do. And that really is one of the most important agape that we have going in there because we know the power of God's answer to our prayer. Mm -hmm. So then um, at that point, there's one time in that weekend on Friday that we come in and this is going to look really bad because I sat on it. <laughs> <laughs> but we have everybody sign a little slip of paper that will offer to pray for this weekend. And we make it into something that looks a lot better than this. But we make it into this chain. And the women are sitting there, and all at once we have a group of our team coming in, singing Amazing Grace, carrying this chain of prayer that stretches all around the room. Um, the ladies, there's not a dry eye. They cannot believe that many people care about them. They don't think anybody does. And so this is a really powerful moment when we do this, stuck in with so many powerful moments on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Could you straighten it out yeah, for me too? <laughs> yeah, I'll fix it all. <laughs> so that's just me. <laughs> Uh, on Saturday, as things go, go on and we become vulnerable, they become more vulnerable, and we start on Saturday encountering Christ, and uh, we have talks. A lot of these talks are scripted, but then the, um, per, the team member adds their own testimony, which can be so powerful, and a forgiveness of others, discovery, Christian action, then at one point, we have these agape letters. The team has all written letters to every one of these participants. Uh, they go in at one point, and they sit down at the family table, and there is a bag of letters. Well, some of these ladies have never gotten a letter since they've been there. While they're opening letters, the team is sitting behind another wall and singing praises to God and this kind of thing, singing praises. And it's just a powerful, powerful time for these ladies. And then at that evening, they get open mic and they can start talking about what they're learning from the weekend. I, this is Saturday I'm talking about now. Um, and um, Saturday, oh, another thing. Early on Saturday, we give each of them a rice paper. And on that paper, they're writing down people they need to forgive are people they need to ask forgiveness. And that evening, we have a ceremony where they take that rice paper and put that rice paper in water and it dissolves. If you could see the reaction of some of these ladies and men um, when they drop that in there and they just feel that weight being lifted. So powerful. And um, then we give them cookies. It used to be a cookie kairos because the community would make chocolate chip cookies, but COVID took care of that. So now we have to buy the cookies. And, but we pass those cookies out to the whole prison at one point. But this evening, they take a bag of cookies home for someone they need to forgive and are asked forgiveness. So the next morning, we hear lots of different stories about what happened with that. And so then on Sunday, it's coming to an end. And we have, um, we give them Bibles. We give them a cross if they like it. And if you could see how close these family tables have become. Uh, they've shared so much with each other and with us. And so uh, we do have a community closing where people from outside that community, our communities, can go and witness a closing as the women get, get up and speak of what it meant. 
So I would love to invite you all to do that one of these days. Mm -hmm. So I go in on Thursday through Sunday this week, and I would just love for you all, if you could be a part of this ministry and just praying for us. So I'm going to be outside my husband, Larry. Um, he's the one that got me into this first place. Um, he's the one that's really good. I'm just kind of follow his lead. Um, I'll be outside, and if you would like to be a part of it and pray for us this weekend, we would so appreciate it because um, these ladies find Jesus in there. There have been a number of them who have said to me before, I have never known freedom, but I have found it here in prison. Wow. And that's Jesus. So thank yeah, you let's, all. Let's just do that now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for Marty's passion for women who are in prison, seeking purpose, dealing with shame and guilt. And we're grateful for Kairos and the ministry they have to the hearts of these ladies. Thank you for Larry and his ministry in men's prisons as well, and we give them to you today. This weekend is so important, as women will hear of your great grace and your love. So we pray that you would raise up men and women like us to pray for them. But more than anything, we pray your spirit would speak to the hearts of these ladies so they can know true freedom in Jesus. We give Marty to you to that end for her ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you, Marty. Here, let me have this. The tray. And come out back there afterwards. Oh, yeah. Stand together, please. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus.
life can bring us storms. Those moments where we wander, wonder, doubt. The journey doesn't stop, but the progress does. It can be lonely, painful. Sometimes we try to stare it down, as if we could somehow will it to go away. Or we think we can go toe to toe and come out the other side, unscathed. We often forget just how small we are. The truth is, storms are inevitable. But when they appear, we have a protector. A savior who knows a thing or two about calming storms. A God who is a stronghold in times of trouble. In our weakness, He is strong. In our fear, He is courage. In our desperation, He is peace. Yes, storms are inevitable. But our God is invincible. I always hear the Jeopardy music when I'm waiting quietly like this uh, for the lights to come on. There I am. Good morning. Do you know what phobias are? Phobias. Um, if you look at the actual definition, it says when something causes you to feel fear or anxiety, that it's so severe, it consistently and overwhelmingly disrupts your life. Phobia. Uh, to better understand it, we could go to the original language, and the word phobia comes from the word phobia, or phobos, and, and, and it's interesting when you look at uh, the original word, uh, you find other uh, different venues and different disciplines using it all of the time. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic says you can't know the number of phobias there are because there are so many nuances of phobias. While other psychology periodicals and organizations estimate that there's anywhere between 100 and 550 unique phobias, fears. Well, however many there are, Jesus asks the question, why? Why are there so many phobias? Now, we've been talking about what Jesus said, and we've been looking deep into the scriptures all year long, and now we're in a series, Big Questions Jesus Asked, and today I want to go right to that big one that he might be asking you right now. Uh, if you have a Bible or a device with the Bible on it, we're going to Mark's Gospel today, and we'll be reading from chapter 4, and we're gonna go through a story of something that Jesus encountered with his disciples and used to teach them. Now, Mark's theme, the whole theme of his gospel is that Jesus is the servant Messiah. And Jesus busy, is busy in the beginning of the story teaching and performing many miracles and he wants to take his disciples from the northern bank of the Sea of Galilee to the eastern bank bank of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is 696 feet below sea level, and as a result, it's easy for storms and huge winds to pick up in that region, especially at night. And therefore, those sudden violent storms and downdrafts could be very precarious for anyone who is out on the water. And with that in mind, let me read you the story from Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. And so they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. 
But soon a fierce storm came up, and high waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. And Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. Now, we're going to pause here, and before we get to the question Jesus asked in the story, we need to understand the context. You see, there's something we need to explain from this event that you thought we believed that Jesus makes life all chocolate and unicorns and memory foam mattresses. But here's the first thing we learn, is that even though you're in Jesus' boat, you'll still face storms. Now, notice it wasn't a disciple who had the idea of getting in the boat and said, come on, let's go, and why don't you ride along, Jesus? Jesus said, let us cross to the other side of the lake. Now, the potential danger here was not lost on him. He knew the realities of nighttime storms on this water, and here's the positive part of the story. They actually did it. I mean, these were veteran fishermen among this crowd of followers, and they knew the potential for rough weather on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus says, let's go, and they all get in the boat. Pretty impressive, I think. Well, they had seen his miracles and were aware of his ability to heal and restore and transcend the laws of nature. But in their minds, that meant no worries, be happy. So in the midst of their obedience and their faith, the unexpected challenge happens, a great windstorm on the sea. Now, the New American Standard Bible, with a very literal translation of the original language, says, a fierce gale of wind with waves breaking over the boat. Um, imagine yourself on something like an oversized canoe and the winds are breaking up, and the waters are coming over onto the boat, and you're bailing, and you say to yourself, okay, this is not what I signed up for. And maybe this seems like a sort of Captain Obvious statement, but storms happen, and they happen in your life. Yet we sometimes tie our faith to our circumstances. We have this unspoken idea that obedience to God means comfort and protection and ease should be guaranteed to us. And prosperity and no neighbor dogs pooping in our yard and everybody gets along so wonderfully because of Jesus. Well, we can believe that always doing the right thing leads to always getting a winning outcome in this life depending on your definition of winning outcome. The bottom line is that even though you're in Jesus' boat, you'll still face storms. It happened to them, and it will happen to you. It's perfect timing, by the way, that the cameraman comes here taking pictures of Valletta, because I want to tell you about Valletta this morning. You can read it in her book, Another Valley, Another Victory, because Valletta Crumley followed Jesus most of her life, and she often followed him into some very stormy situations. She said yes to his call, and it included assault, and pain, and grief, and illness, and many other tidal waves of struggle. And her stories are examples that even the most faithful follower can counter extremely difficult situations and challenges. And the Bible, men and women, does not paint over pain. And Valletta Crumley would tell you that 
pain has been a big part of the experience, and yet she would also say, as you can read in the book, that she wouldn't trade the pain that came for not following the Lord. The Lord does, doesn't include those stories in the Bible so that our fears will be elevated when we recognize that pain is part of it. Rather, he empowers our response to all of those situations. And when this storm came up, the disciples, in fact, responded. Look again at verse 38. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, fear can cause us to believe that Jesus isn't there and Jesus doesn't care. But it's interesting, isn't it, how a storm can quickly turn you from faith to fright and fright that's overwhelming? I mean, an hour ago, we were on the northern shore, and we were fired up about all the crowds, all the miracles, and all of the popularity of being around the one who's performing all of this. An hour ago, we had no trouble believing that Jesus was worth following because all of the bad things seemed to be turning to good. And so getting in a boat for a nighttime Sea of Galilee sail promises to get my five-star TripAdvisor review. But the problem is, it doesn't always happen that way. I might even get a little one-on-one -on -one conversation with this celebrity while I'm in the boat doing the crossing, but he falls asleep on the ride. What a bummer that is. And it's when the storm hits and things start looking dicey that we can forget who is in the boat with us. And I had no trouble believing when it was sunny and 72, but now I'm not so sure. And at some point, they realized that the answer might be found in at least waking him up. And that always makes me laugh, because while these disciples were freaking out, Jesus was just out. And the fact that they went to him to deal with this problem was a good thing, but they what they said to him revealed what they were lacking in this moment. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? See, they'd already made up their mind about the outcome, and they were a little concerned that Jesus didn't seem bothered by it at all. But their method was good, shouting in desperation. I like that part of their response, calling him teacher, honor, and respect. I like that part of their response. Well, then, well, don't you care that we're going to drown? There it is. There it is. You ever prayed a prayer like that? Hey, hello. Here I am, right here, big storm all around. Hello? Anybody there? You ever been in that place? When things go south, fear can cause us to believe that Jesus isn't there and that Jesus doesn't care. And when we stare at the storm instead of the one who spoke the storm into being, we can experience incapacitating fear. So we panic or we make poor choices or we do nothing and it just compounds our fear and our anxiety. Now, remember, they had just seen his power demonstrated in miracles and in healings. But listen, knowing what's true about him and actually finding our confidence in him are two different things. Now, I have a friend who's a businessman, and some years ago, he was facing a dilemma that his biggest client, who had over 50% of his business, was asking him to do something that would compromise his values, and especially as he followed Jesus in his life. And he didn't want to do it, and he even asked him if he could do some other things that he knew this guy would appreciate, but they said, no, you have to do this, and he couldn't do it. He was facing that kind of storm where he might lose his business and all of his employees would now be unemployed. He was scared. 
and he was wondering what he should do. And my friend asked, Jesus, are you there? Do you see what I'm going through? And that's where he was, and that's where the disciples were in the boat as well, and maybe that's where you are today, or maybe you'll be there tomorrow, but chances are good you're gonna face a storm. And the question is, will you know that he is there and that he cares for you? You see, it's the next part of the story where we read the big questions Jesus asks his followers. Here they are again, verse 39. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, we can manage our fear through faith in who Jesus is and how much Jesus cares. Because it's in the storm that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you, not just for who he is as God of the universe, God in the flesh, but also that he's there as your savior, as your Lord, helping you see your life is worth so much more than the current circumstance that you're dealing with. He's worthy of your worship, men and women, but he's also worthy of your trust. Now, let's focus on Jesus' two questions. Why are you so afraid, and do you still have no faith? Now, if you read the Bible from start to finish, you'll find that faith is a thread throughout all of Scripture. You'll see in Genesis, it begins for us with Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Then we find Jesus saying, those who believe in him have faith in him will have eternal life. And then Paul later says that we are saved by grace through faith. It's all about who we are, embracing what he has done for us that we can't do for ourselves. The entire story is about believing who Jesus is and trusting how much he cares for you. So the question, why are you afraid? If you believe in him enough to wake him up from his stormy nap, well then why are you afraid in this moment? You had enough faith to get in the boat to, in the first place. Do you still have that kind of faith when the waves are coming over the sides of the boat? It's because you're focused on the present storm and not the one who created you for a much bigger purpose than the storm that you're experiencing right now. And sometimes we have no trouble believing in who he is. It, it, it's what we have trouble believing is that he cares enough that he's going to do something in us and through us. He's going to help us deal with the struggle, the suffering, the mourning, the broken relationships, our fears. Notice in this situation, he doesn't reprimand them for being afraid. I mean, it's a serious storm that they can't control. Rather, he asks a question that points them back to the place where they can manage their fear in this moment. Him. You see, when all you have to live for is living, then you're reducing your life to a lower purpose than what he wants for you to experience as you live and breathe. And any threat to that purpose can drive you to incapacitating fear unless you look to the one who can help you overcome it. When you have more to live for than just living, and you know who holds the keys to eternal life, you can face your fears with boldness and confidence, and in some cases, even anticipation, looking forward to seeing how he works it out in this situation. Jesus is fully aware of their humanity and that they left their life jackets on the North Shore. He understands why they fear dying, 
And that's why he wants them to find the answer to his questions in him. And it's what he wants you to be reminded of again today, no matter what storm you're in or what storm you will face. In Jesus, the fear of dying can be managed with the promise of heaven and eternal life and joy forever. And when our faith in him and our hope is built on his promises, we can face the challenges and dangers of this world with courage. Courage. And remember, courage is not the absence of fear. Rather, it's living for something more important than the thing that causes you to fear. In this case, trusting Jesus means knowing peace in the midst of a storm. In our case, trusting Jesus means knowing peace in the midst of any challenge that this life throws your way. And I think Jesus intentionally chose these words to make his point to them and now to us. Silence and be still. But when I hear Jesus speak those words, it just makes me want to exhale. Exhale. You can let it out. And you can rest in that promise that he actually has the power over all. So that you can be restored to peace in your spirit when your life surroundings are like a raging storm and you don't know what to do about it. Can you hear him? See, that's why we can manage our fear through faith in who he is and how much he cares. I've told you before about Stephanie and my good friend, Juliana Barker. She and her husband, Martin, do a lot of our graphic design for us, and actually Julie did the graphic design for all these series for us, and just a precious, precious friend of ours. And quite a few years ago, she was one of the youth leaders in our student ministry back in Ohio, and she was informed that she had breast cancer and went through all of the treatments, did everything she was supposed to do, and we were thankful that the cancer all went away, disappeared, and we praised God for that. And then this past year, it all came back with a vengeance. And now it's in a lot of places in her body. And she's telling her story, so we'll all pray for her, and we do. But in her most recent Caring Bridge post, here's what Juliana said. My prayer is for God to continue to bring restora restoration and renewal through his spirit those of us who are his hands and feet, and much good that is accomplished through common grace, ultimately flowing from him. In this contentious season, may we not respond out of fear, but be reminded, love conquers all. And when she says that, she means his love conquers all. You see, what Juliana understands in this moment of her life where she's facing an eternity, she recognizes who he is, but she also understands how much he cares. And we can face every challenging circumstance with confidence as Jesus leads all of us to get into his boat. He can be trusted because we know who he is because we know that he cares. And Peter reminded his friends in the midst of tremendous persecution when he said, through Christ you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You see, on this side of the resurrection, we know, in fact, he is the one who can say silent, be still, to the storms that rage in our life. And he is the one who's in the boat with us, who can give us confidence and courage in the midst of our most difficult hour because he provides us hope, which means profound certainty. And this is what we have now, and they didn't have it yet, 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, if there's anything that you can count on in your life, feel confidence from, and celebrate, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And verse 41 says they actually looked at him with terror when they saw his power over nature. In other words, we shouldn't be fearing the storm. We should be fearing the one who can control the storm, who has power over the storm. That's the one we should worship. That's the one we should follow. That's the one who we can believe in. And eventually they'd figure it out when they saw him risen from the dead. Now, I don't know if you have any bona fide phobias, you know, real um, medically, uh, medical, medical diagnosis of phobia. I get it. But I'm sure you'll be confronted with some legitimate challenges that might cause you to wonder if God is really there and if Jesus really cares. But I'm praying his death and resurrection on your behalf will be enough to give you the faith you need to face any challenge, any storm. So ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Jesus is asking me that. What am I afraid of? Talking to someone who offended you or you offended and to seek reconciliation? or the diagnosis that will seem to end your life or the life of someone you love, or leaving your current good job for a new and different job you feel like he's calling you to, or the person you didn't vote for getting elected, (gasps) cutting something loose that you know doesn't belong in your life, or saying yes to Jesus' invitation to putting your faith in him. What are you afraid of? I promise you, no one has more power and no one loves you more than Jesus Christ. So what are you afraid of? Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for giving us this story to remind us of who you are and how deeply you love us. Thank you for going to the cross to take all of our condemnation and our punishment upon yourself. Thank you for rising from the dead so that we can know eternal life and have confidence in your power. And today, Lord, we bow our heads with many challenges and many storms that we bring to you. And we ask you to grant us confidence and courage that you will walk through these storms with us. Set our hearts, our minds at ease. Bring peace to our spirits and silence all fear. We ask you in this moment. Go ahead, you pray and bring your fear to him. What is it that might be holding you back from discovering the great joy of following him? Tell him about it right now in this moment. Oh, it's your great grace, Lord, that gives us confidence that you aren't just an all-powerful God who's far off and not concerned with our lives, but in fact, you have come to save us, to rescue us, and to give us peace. So I pray as you've heard the prayers of the people lifted up to you in this moment, that you would give that courage, that purpose, and that peace. And we'll thank you for your great promises. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, let's just stand, keep worshiping, glorify him, sing to him, honor him, pray to him, respond to what he said to you today. When peace
we have. It's not just a message we want for our community. It's a message we want to share with the world. And that's why I hope you'll be back next week and engaged with our missions celebration uh, on your seat again today, our faith promise cards. If you weren't here last week, we're just asking you uh, to read that little pamphlet and, and ask the Lord, what, it, what is it that I can trust you to give in faith promised in 2025 so we can support missionaries? It's going to be a great time of learning and growing in them. But listen to this. We have a service to kick off our mission celebration on the Saturday night before. There's a little card on your chair. Those of you who are with us online, you can find all of this in the Southland Church events on the website. We hope you'll be here for that night of worship. Invite people to come with you so that they too can hear this message. We're excited about what God's going to do in, in ministry and in all of our lives over the next two Sundays and even that Saturday night before. So be here and you'll love it. You'll enjoy it. And God will speak volumes into you as how you can be part of what we're doing with mission ministry. Also, if you didn't get a blue bag last week when you left, uh, they'll be there passing those out, making sure that you have something to bring food back for the refuge, particularly uh, instant potatoes. That's our assigned thing, but also uh, peanut butter and cereal, both assigned to us as well. Bring it back in droves so that we can bless people this Thanksgiving. Lord Jesus, as we go out of here today, one thing we're sure of, it's well with our soul. Not because of anything we've done, but because what you have done for us. So today we declare we believe, and I pray that your spirit would descend upon each one today who is facing a difficulty, a challenge, a storm. And we ask, O oh Lord, that your peace would permeate their hearts and minds. We give ourselves to you 
To that end, the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week.